Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us once again. I am your host, Ben Crossman. And yeah, we have a great show lined up for you today because, you know, just like it has been since time's long gone, we have Michael Cermak here with us. He is the owner and operator of TechGuy.org. And yeah, we're going to be talking all things uh, technology. And, you know, lately we've been, you know, delving into kind of uh, you know new events new technology and uh, things that we're looking forward to in the technology field with uh, you know with Mike as always it's you know a lot of fun so thank you for tuning in and well before we get to our guests a few things that we should mention including computeramerica.com that is especially important for shows such as today because any articles any videos that we do anything that we talk about will be found in the show notes at computeramerica.com also you'll find links to our guest website and uh, and also while you're at Computer America, be sure to enter the contest uh, this Friday. New winner, Logitech. Uh, yeah, you know that's the shorthand of it. And the last thing is of course the live video feed, where you can watch Computer America and not just listen. You know, hey, it's uh, a little bit more fun. And you know, as we do articles and you know, we'll show video clips and things like that. We're still a radio show, but uh, you know, adding another dimension to what we do here. So. I think with all of that, why don't we just uh, get things started because, you know, we have a lot of topics to talk about and I have a feeling we're going to be, well, probably not getting to all of them, but we're going to do our best. <laughs> so joining us is again, Michael Cermak. So Mike, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. My pleasure. How are you doing today, Benjamin? Not too bad. Not too bad. Uh, you know, and everyone out there who's listening, I know that yesterday we had a best of, we replayed our episode where we had AMD on uh, the show. That was great. But uh, yeah, personal appointment and uh, happy to be back, happy to do another show. And I think, uh, I mean, heck, how have you been uh, since you were last on? I'm doing very, very well. Cannot complain. Life is good. Thank you for asking. I I always wondered this, and I I know it seems like this may hurt a few people in their souls when I ask them this, but... um, you know, the holidays are coming up. I think Halloween is kind of the you know demarcation line uh, between <laughs> the everyday year and the holidays. Um, and I know that you put on quite the spectacle with uh, house lights and things like that. I do how, indeed. How much? How much prep time? Like, do you start doing that in November or things like? Oh my no, that's much too late. Much too. Late. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you're quite right. Yeah. I, I saw, as many people did, yeah, many years ago, I don't know, when, maybe eight years ago, um, when the the uh, video started going around YouTube of the guy who had really first done this with his house and had music playing and the light, Christmas lights, you know, flashing to the music. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it was kind of a big, you know, viral video back in the day. And I said, well, I can do that. And so naturally that meant I had to do that. <laughs> and so we started doing it on a very small scale and, and it's grown and grown. And, and we switched actually to all LED lights last year, and which is very exciting for me being the nerd. And for those nerds listening, the LED lights we use are actually individually addressable. So any light on the house, I can say, turn that one blue, turn that one this shade of green, turn that one. It's, oh, it's just magical. And, very, very cool. Which means you can do all sorts of amazing effects, you know, have them sweep one way or the other or do anything you could imagine. Um, so, yeah, I, I, we start planning and programming pretty early for that. And this year we're not changing a whole lot. Last year was a big change as far as changing LEDs and so on. But, right. yeah, it, it's a lot. It's way too much work and way too much planning. And every year, especially when I start trying to put stuff up and running wires, I'm like, why the heck am I doing this? And then I get, you know, the car stop and talk to me a little bit, especially while I'm setting it up. And the kids are so excited and they tell me which song is their favorite. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> all right. Just... <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, and actually uh, uh, your story actually just reminded me of something that I saw, you know, either today or yesterday. Um, I'll probably, uh, you know, send you uh, the video. Actually, I have, I think it's, uh, 
here it is um yeah I, I saw this yesterday floating around social media i'll send you a link through skype as we speak and for anyone out there watching the video portion we'll play the uh, video right here but it's a 2.1 million pixel display because i was thinking about you know all the lights you were talking about and you know how you can address each one of them i thought you know maybe you could turn the front of your house into like a screen and do that kind of thing this is you know this is in vegas with uh you know in one of the bars they just went through a big renovation and about halfway through the video they show what they can do with it and you know for the low low price of 2.5 million dollars you can uh you know you can get one of these things and yeah it's a 2.1 million pixel display that hangs from the ceiling and it's like uh, i think it's like 24 by 8 feet by 4 feet and yeah they can do a lot of really cool things with this so and i've actually seen this one before the really cool thing with it if it's the one i'm thinking of and i think it is yeah is that it moves right yeah oh yeah for sure well well, well I, I, no uh, uh this one uh, as far as i know is a fixed uh kind of installation okay is it yeah. there's one that's kind of similar maybe it's not as big but where parts of it move to make it even more three-dimensional mm. so, uh, I, I guess I, you know the, yeah. If your if your budget's only two million dollars, then I guess you can't get the real crazy. Ah, yeah, <laughs> that's absolutely it. So, but I, I mean, you know, j just so very very cool. So I don't know why that spr sprung to mind. But why don't I we get started it. with uh, you know with a couple of our stories here, and they are not about two point five million uh, dollar displays, but we have a few here that are more down to earth and more. Uh, Practical, I think, would be the best one. So, uh, since you are our guest, I will let you decide where you want to start today's show. I think we've got to go with the Google stories. I mean, that that's the big news today. That's what's happening. That is we've piping got... hot. Yeah, it's piping hot. Yeah. yeah, piping hot. So Google has just announced some of their new hardware that's coming out. The biggest, you know, most important thing is the new Pixel, the Google Pixel 2. Mm -hmm. And so the Google Pixel, the original Pixel, came out last year and was one of the first. It's hard to say it's the first step of Google into hardware because Google's kind of had this weird, you know, one foot in, one foot out of hardware for the longest time that, you know, they want to make Android, but they want to let hardware manufacturers do their thing. But then they kind of want to make their own phone and they've teamed up with you know, a couple different companies to do that over the years. And HTC made the, the Google Pixel last year. And it's been a funny thing thing where where they don't seem real clear on whether or not they want to actually get into the hardware game but but they're getting more and more serious about it and they just announced the pixel 2 just moments ago and uh, it's very strikingly similar to the pixel uh the the biggest difference for me is that it's water resistant the pixel was ip53 and mm -hmm. for those who don't know the first number of that is dust resistance the second number is water resistance uh so ip53 is not very water resistant i mean you can use it when you're in the rain but you don't want to use it anywhere <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> if it's a really bad shower it's you wouldn't want to take it in the shower uh so so the new pixel 2 it has a rating of ip67 which is is you know a huge difference. I mean that is waterproof basically, and about uh, on par with uh, the Samsung Galaxy and the uh, iPhone, blah blah blah. But yeah, I, I mean you know it goes from you don't want to get this thing wet to if you accidentally drop it in the toilet, uh, it should be okay. Right, you might not want to touch it because it was in the toilet, but it will still function. It's not Absolutely. an instant death sentence as it is with a lot of devices, and that's a key factor for me. I have an I, I, uh, Samsung Galaxy, uh, and I didn't get the Pixel when it came out last year, mostly because of that reason. I, I an IP53, I thought that was just much too risky. I am, I am, you know, around water much too often to hold a six hundred and fifty dollar phone. <laughs> <laughs> with me absolutely but this might be enough to get me to switch i mean the more i'm reading about this the more interested i am to be honest uh yeah. and and it's much many of the other specs are very very similar to the original pixel um the other big change on it though is no headphone jack and i am not going to be surprised at all when you know apple when they did it there were riots in the streets well maybe not that bad but you know <laughs> i don't quite remember that <laughs> yeah pe people were throwing hissy fits though that uh yeah, you know, sure. that that apple wasn't uh you know doing the uh, and there the were a jack. lot of android people making fun of apple for doing that right <laughs> and then here's yeah. google doing the same thing I, I i mean i actually remember people saying well google pixels phone it does have the headphone jack so that's my new go-to phone because i think the samsung one uh you know and you would know better than i would i think they did away with it too like with their latest product or 
uh, or might still have it, but um, I, I'm sure that they're not far behind if they haven't done it already. And, you know, before the show, you were asking me, you know, why would they do this? Because you're right. I, I mean, it's a pretty good question because standards exist for a reason. And, you know, uh, when things are standard in an industry, you don't just kind of throw them away for no reason. A lot of people are invested in them. A lot of people have hardware that only works with that standard. Um, you know, and I think a lot of people see it as not a lot of trade-off for getting rid of it. Like, you don't really uh, gain a lot. It seems like the, the biggest thing, and I don't know if this is the case, but it seems to be that, that water resistance rating might be one of the yeah, trade-offs. That's my. That's what I was thinking as well. Right. Uh, and I don't know what the IP rating is on my Samsung. I'll have to look it up because it's a pretty high one. That's part of the reason I picked it. And it does have a headphone jack. Um, and I just looked it up, the new Samsung Galaxy 8. Um, now, maybe I'm wrong. I want to double check here. Sure. I believe it does have a headphone jack. Yeah, but, it does. Yeah, but one of a dying breed. And I, I mean, you know, I think you're right. And I think water resistance is a big part of it. And I think the other part of it is just space. I mean, they're trying to make these things thinner and thinner and thinner and smaller and smaller and smaller and have more and more screen space and less bezel. Uh, and getting rid of, I mean, that's pretty, I mean, it's relatively small, but I mean, it's a chunk of, of hardware in there to be able to accept that jack. It is, it is. And I, I think for Apple, um, I, I mean, you know, at least for Apple, it kind of makes sense. It's their MO. They did away with the CD drive on their computers. They did away with a mm -hmm. uh, floppy disk drive. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, it's kind of their thing. And, you know, I, I can see with the iPhone 10 uh, that they just kind of showcased, they still have the power cord. But they introduced, you know, wireless charging into that iPhone. It's, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if their next big move would be to do away with essentially all cables or, you know, find some way to make wireless charging a bit more portable and then yeah. officially do away with all cables. Like, it's not like we don't have a solution if we do away with all the ports. It's just yeah. what people are used to. And it's, it's a step that can have a lot of drawbacks. I just don't see Google going to be, you know, taking a bullet for this one. Yeah, I think you're right. I don't think Google wants to be the first one to do it, but they sure were not far behind. Uh, and then the other thing, you mentioned wireless charging, and I love that on my Galaxy phone. It's sitting on a wireless charger in front of me as we speak. Uh, the Pixel 2 doesn't have wireless charging, and I was a little surprised by that. I I, I am and I'm not. I mean, uh, there was a study, I, I heard it through NPR, that they kind of asked people about wireless charging. Uh, very cool that you use it. But I mean, uh, if you could be candid with us here, how, you know, what percentage would you say you kind of use wireless charging? Because, you know, uh, they found with a lot of people that when they're at home or, you know, they're in bed, it makes sense because they have the wireless charging pad, but not a right. lot of people fork over, you know, the extra $100, $150 for multiple pads to do it in multiple places. Like they always carry the cord with them. How often do you find yourself doing it? I use it every day at work, and and I should also mention the wireless chargers aren't quite that expensive anymore. I mean, even the the Samsung brand one on mm -hmm. Amazon is twenty five dollars. I just oh, looked up. Oh, that's not bad. Um, so they're no, they're really not bad. And you can get fancier ones that are you know fifty dollars, but they're they're not bad. Um, but so I use this one at work every day because it's convenient. It's sitting on my desk. It's and it even this one is my kind of like a stand as well. So it holds the phone up. So it's looking at me at a nice angle. Um, and it's convenient. I can grab it and go and don't have to fumble with wires, you know, as I walk in and out of the office. Um, at home by my bed, I actually have a regular wire there, but have often thought about getting a wireless charger for that as well. My biggest concern with that is back in the day when wireless charging first started, I forget even which device it was I had that supported it. I did that, and a couple of nights I would accidentally bump the phone at some point during mm. the night, and it was just off kilter enough that it didn't charge. And, you know, so I've, I kind of hesitate to do it at night just for that because it has to be pretty well lined up to, to really charge. Right. Um, but and of course, in the car, there's no oh, sensible yeah, way no. of having it on. They're not the way I drive. So it has to be plugged in in the car. Otherwise, it's sliding all over the place. It, it, it seems like between wireless charging, between, uh, you know, doing away with the headphone jack, eventually within a generation or two, I feel like all the top end phones, all the phones that are, you know, trying to hit the price point that iPhone, that Samsung, that uh, Pixel does, they're all sure. going to converge. You know, the headphone jack is probably going to go away. Wireless charging is going to be standard. Um, yep. You know, that's something I that think you you're right expect, because so. there's no reason for it. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think back of how often I actually plug a thing into my phone. 
And it's not that often. I have wireless headphones. I've got you know the wireless charger. I mean, I I do plug it in at night to charge it, but that would be pretty easy to replace. the The problem would be in the car. I think they'd have to come up with a pretty good connection, you know, wireless charger for in the car. That could be done. It'd be something I've, like a case, yeah, you know, that you I, would drop it in. I, I've kind of seen it, and it's like these sticky pads. We actually, uh, you know, uh, got a few of them here, uh, you know, from a company, and it's like a sticky pad. Like it's not really sticky, sticky. Like you touch it, and yeah. it's not residue. Just friction. But yeah, you know, j just enough friction for the phone just to kind of stick on there. Um, but you know, even more to your point, uh, you know, we're later on in the program, uh, as we usually do, we talk about different kinds of cars and electric cars and autonomous cars. But some of the newer models of, of vehicles actually have like a little slot, uh, you know, kind of built into the center console that are wireless chargers. Like, like car manufacturers yep. are starting to build, you know, well, at least have the option to build into it. I haven't seen a wireless charger one in a car. I, I believe you. I haven't seen it. Um, I have seen them with different, you know, changeable adapters in them. So you can throw in a, you know, lightning or a USB-C or micro USB or whatever in there to be able to drop it in. Right. But it would make sense. I mean, why, if they can do that, certainly they could make a wireless one. The problem is, you know, compatibility. You know, you've got the Samsung uses it based on the QI standard. Is that right? And I'm not sure if Apple's Apple is does QI. the same one. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Okay, well, then then it's – I'm shocked. Look at that. Apple, Apple doing something compatible Apple, with the mainstream phones. Yeah. Apple uh, – yeah, they, they really didn't make a big deal out of it, but uh, – they. I'm sorry. They did make a big deal out of wireless charging, but you're right. They didn't try to go off and make their own standard. They're just like, yeah, it works with any QI charge you already own. And everyone's like, well, all right. Yeah, no, good, good going, Apple. <laughs> I don't have to buy the hardware from Apple? What world is this? <laughs> it, it was definitely a good move, and uh, QI yeah, seems to be awesome. a, a, I'm glad they did a that. pretty good I didn't standard. Know that. So getting back to the Google Pixel 2 phones versus the uh, yeah. Google Pixel phones, I mean, uh, again, we included a link in the show notes to, uh, you know, kind of the before and after, and, you know, nothing really, and, you know, more to your point, nothing really stands out as a quantum leap. I mean, the only thing seems to be the, uh, you know, the CPU going from uh, quad-core to octa-core, which, right. you know, if so multitasking should be a little bit better, which is good for a phone. Um, you know, the camera is surprisingly similar, but during their event, they said that this is the best camera in any phone out there, right. like, you know, which was always kind of the Pixel's selling point was we have a damn good camera. That was always their selling point. It was, you're right. And, and at this point, it's not a lot of room to improve, I think. No, no I, and you're right, probably not. But, uh, but of course it is Google. So one thing that they, I think they do have over Apple and Samsung is, the fact that they're tied in with Google ecosystem, you know, Google Photos, Google, uh, you know, Gmail or whatever, Google Drive. Like, I think their cloud integration is, you know, way better than most of the other, uh, you know, companies out there. So, I mean, y you're right, though. This phone does not shock and awe. It's just like, oh, they built another one. Awesome. Yeah, it's just a slight iteration over the last one and 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 the biggest deal though i think a slight iteration with waterproofing is a big deal i think that was a major disappointment when the pixel first came out and the other thing to mention on this is it does have less bezel i mean that's the way all of these top end devices are going and we've talked about that at length with the new apple phone yeah but i mean it's it's significantly less bezel if you look at the official product photos of the pixel 2 uh, they didn't do the weird, you know, uh, um, sensor uh, uh, spot like Apple did, but it's it is a lot more screen and a lot less bezel around it, and it looks sharp. I like it a lot. Not bad, not bad. And the price, I mean, you can't really argue that. You know, compared to the iPhone 10, you know, this is Google's flagship phone. Their flagship phone is, you know, two hundred and fifty dollars cheaper than either of the competitors. And you know, hey, that two fifty, that can matter a lot when it comes time to Heck actually yeah, buy a phone. So, yep. yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, the other story here real quick that we had about Google, um, well, actually, we had like, you know, a couple more because they did come out with, with some new, you know, different products. But the last one with the phone here is uh, the story here from Gadget saying that they don't need a SIM card if you're a Project Fi customer. And, you know, uh, yeah. it, it, Mike, I'll be honest with you. I have not really been keeping up with Project Fi. I had heard about it. Uh, it was Google's attempt to kind of start their own com uh, competition to traditional cell phone carriers. I mean, uh, have you been keeping up to date on Project Fi? 
Yeah, I was involved in Project Phi actually when it first came out. I was a beta tester on it, and unfortunately in my area it didn't have real great coverage. I'm out in Pennsylvania in the boonies, and you know it is what it is. There's just not a lot of great coverage with a lot of providers. But Project Phi actually uses – so it, as you said, it, it is Google acting as your cell provider. So you pay them a monthly fee instead of your cell provider. And one of the biggest benefits is that you paid how much you use. You, know, you didn't have to buy some package that you know had more minutes or data than what you actually used, you paid for what you you actually used, uh, and they were really good pricing. Uh, and the way they did it is they didn't go out and put up their own you know towers. They actually are built on the back end of Sprint and T-Mobile and U.S. Cellular. Mm -hmm. uh, so whatever the way it works is it actually has you know a SIM card in it, or they used to sell uh, and they still do dual SIM cards so that you could connect to whichever type of tower you're closest to, and the phone would try to figure out which one had the best signal for where you were right then and connect you to it. Uh, so it's it's I, I'm expecting it's probably improved quite a bit over the last two years since I've tried it. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm kind of eager to give it another whirl. Yeah, uh, it, it it probably has uh, definitely increased, and it says that uh, the Google Pixel uses a digital SIM card. So you know, no longer That's having cool. to to fiddle with the little thing. It's uh, just some you know just some data that they permanently put on your operating system, saying this is my SIM information. Uh, you know, just bringing a little piece, uh, a little piece of hardware into the digital age. So that's good. And I bet that would help it operate even better, because um, some of the problems on the early, early Project Phi when they were first starting was delays in switching between networks and searching for networks. And I would think that having the digital SIM card would help improve that. Right. So, yep. And uh, let's, let's see. Any other? I think there was one other. It was like a Google uh, Clip. I think was the name. Yeah. Of it, if I can Isn't find that it. an interesting device? Yeah. Just did. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, did you read up any on this? Yeah, a little bit. So, so it's a camera. Uh, it's called Google Clips, and it's just a little freestanding standalone camera that you sit somewhere, and it's supposed to be a smart camera that decides when to take pictures and short videos for you so that you can then share them later. Uh, and I don't know. It's one of those things where I don't quite understand the usefulness of it, why I would use that instead of some my phone, for example. It does have a shutter button on it, so you can tell it when you want to take a picture, but the idea is that it can be taking pictures whenever it thinks it ought to. Uh, yeah. It's kind of – I don't know. It, and it's 250 bucks, which for – a device that I'm not sure that I'll ever use. I don't know. They, now they, I do have kids, and I could kind sure. of see sitting it somewhere, and you know. But more more often than not, I would just use my phone. Right. They use this word that I'm not a fan of, and I hope that other companies don't do it because it doesn't it doesn't say anything technical. It says automatically, and this may be just be right. um, you know this may either be something directly from Google's press release, or this may just be the author from a gadget you know kind of taking liberty. But, um, you know, obviously artificial intelligence come a long way. I guess, you know, they're kind of knowing that when uh, X amount of motion happens or, uh, you know, something changes rapidly, you know, in front of it, it will kind of clip it and send it to your phone, send it to the cloud. And I guess you kind of like wear it like on your shirt or something like that. And, you know, if, it could happen when you don't pull your phone out or something happens too quickly for your phone to happen. I think like – and. Again, this is all speculation, but I think they're trying to make it like the body cam, but not for cops, just for everyday people. I guess. Interesting. I hadn't thought of it as a wearable. I was looking at their things. I didn't get that impression from it, but I, I actually have a, a friend of mine who, who wants exactly that sort of thing. They want a wearable camera that's just always filming their kids so that they can get whatever you know, yeah. moment they want. Yeah, and and you know we actually just uh, interviewed a company. They uh, it was like Wolf, uh, Wolfcom, I think it was a couple weeks ago, and they're making uh, body cams for people. So there's a market. They've been talking to their customers. Um, you know they see what kind of help dash cams are, what police body cameras are doing, and individuals want something like that. So maybe and again they have a product picture here. You're right. I don't know the exact dimensions of this thing. But, uh -huh. um, you know, it could just be that. So, very, very interesting. So, with, uh, yeah, so with that being said... You're uh, absolutely right, though. It is wearable. I just looked it up. Oh. And it's only two ounces. Yeah, so, so not big at all. I was trying to find the dimensions of it. Oh, it's, it's two inches by two inches. That's not big. No, that would easily be a wearable on your, on your shirt, uh, you know, just like kind of clipped into your shirt pocket or something like that. So, 
not too bad. I, I, I think it's exactly that. I think it's going to be some kind of personal body camera. Uh, is yeah, what they're I kind could of see that. I'm, I'm, I don't know about $250, but I could see that. <laughs> Well, it, yeah, and does I mean, it only yeah. work if it's connected to Wi-Fi? No, I guess it connects. It also has Bluetooth connection to your phone. But so it, yeah. it has to be within range of either your Wi-Fi or or phone, or um, does it have storage for a period of time? These I, are the things we need to know. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm sure we're going to know more about this because, folks, again, uh, as we talk about this, we are insinuating a lot because, hey, this event just happened, and you know, I'm sure more news will come of it. But I'm sure there's you know, at least a little bit of onboard storage. You know, we were just talking about micro SDs and how they just developed the first 500 gigabyte micro SD. Like onboard storage is possible. It's just, it's probably not gonna be much more than, I don't know, 32 gigs probably, but right. enough, uh, enough. So there you go, Google Clip, uh, other Google products. I'm sure later on in the week, we'll uh, discuss other ones. But with that being said, I think, uh, yeah, uh, you know, before we hit the break, why don't we uh, get talking about a couple of different uh, stores? And, you know, personally, if I had my choice, um, I wouldn't mind talking about uh, Yahoo because, you know, obviously Equifax, for good reason, has been dominating the news when it comes to big companies losing personal data. But, you know, one that was equally atrocious, but, you know, maybe not as sensitive because they don't deal with Social Security numbers, uh, was, <laughs> was Yahoo. And, you know, really, that was a big, big story. So you found one that said that the Yahoo hack a couple years ago was actually bigger than we were first led to believe. Yeah, right. And it was pretty huge. When it came out in 2013, Yahoo announced uh, that they had 1 billion user accounts that were compromised. 1 billion with a B. That's a yeah. lot of user accounts compromised. And like you said, fortunately, it doesn't include credit card information or social security numbers or anything like the, the Equifax deal did. Uh, but it did include encrypted passwords. And that's often the case whenever these these attacks happen, is that the, the hackers get in there, get the usernames, passwords, but the passwords are encrypted. So they need to use Use, whoops, sorry. I, uh, they need to use a bit of um, uh, finagling to try and figure out what those passwords are. And there's ways of trying to attack those and use them. So it's still a problem, even if they're encrypted. Uh, but what we found out recently is not, not that it was 1 billion, but they discovered it was actually 3 billion. Mm. And it is that is the number of accounts that actually existed when the hack ha happened. So basically all Yahoo accounts at that time in 2013 were hacked. Yeah, and you know, just to kind of give you, you know, like why that was such a big deal was that they, you know, people said that for Yahoo accounts, it probably didn't mean that much. I mean, people maybe did get personal information, you know, kind of uh, sent to those emails accounts or something like that. But they said that where it was going to start popping up was that now all of this data, all this user data, was going to be added to uh, spammers, to bots, to sure. uh, you know, ways to crack other accounts. So. You know, maybe if you have a Yahoo account, it'll go to iTunes, put in all the information it knows about you, and potentially get into your iTunes account or potentially get into your Amazon account, uh, right. y yada, yada, yada. Well, so, and if your email account becomes compromised, then that can really lead to anything. I mean, especially if you use the same password for your email account as you use for other accounts, yeah. because if one gets compromised, then they all do. But if they have access to your email account, potentially they could go to you know iTunes or any other place and say, forgot my password, oh, true. and have an email to it. So, I mean, it's it's a big deal. You want your email password to be secure. Now, now here's my question. And you work with companies to do you know data security, things like this. I mean, I get that there's a certain level of, you know, not knowing exactly how big of a breach can be kind of immediately. But, you right. know, with, with Equifax, we, you know, we heard that it was, uh, you know, much worse than they previously, you know, kind of let on. And it was a couple months afterwards. Uh, we heard from, uh, you know, now with with, uh, with Yahoo that it was now $3 billion instead of $1 billion. I mean, how... How hard is it to really diagnose when you realize you've been compromised? How hard is it to really diagnose, you know, just kind of how compromised you were? Yeah, it's it's sometimes impossible. I mean, a lot of these hackers will cover their tracks very well and just, you know, destroy security logs so you can't really see what happened or when. Uh, and in most cases, you just have to uh, assume the worst that, you know, if you can't find out exactly what they went into, you have to assume that they were able to get into everything. And, it can yeah. be really difficult to try and figure it out. And, and you know, and part of me, uh, again, um, I, I try not to be a cynic, but part of me believes that just like with Equifax, just like, uh, you know, any other 
a company out there that has to answer to shareholders, they smudge the numbers. They purposely underreport until they have to because, you know, Verizon was considering buying and I think they did purchase Yahoo. They did. And mm -hmm. yeah, you know, something like this could obviously drive prices down. Not what they want. But everyone, music means we're going to take a break. We'll be back. Mike Cermak and more Computer America just after this. Stay tuned. Here we go. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. We are 31 minutes past the hour as we continue on here. And yeah, you know, going from Yahoo that... I, I think at this point, you know, just like with Equifax, the best advice that we can give you here on the show is, you know, they said that like with Equifax, one, 143 million people uh, were compromised. And obviously that's probably about half of the working population here in America um, <laughs> and other places. Just assume you've been hacked. If you have a Yahoo account, just assume you've been hacked. Don't, you know, kind of wish and hope and try to find if you were one of those that were hacked. Um Change your passwords, you know, do what you got to do, and, you know, just assume that you were compromised at, at this point. There's there's no no better, um, uh, you know, advice that we can give you. I will say, though, 3 billion email accounts. There's only, like, what, 7.4 billion people on Earth? <laughs> they have a lot of, uh, you know, email accounts. Well, and how many of those people have multiple accounts, obviously? You know, oh, you've, for sure. you've got a lot of overlap there, but you're right. That's a lot of accounts. That is, a, I'm, I'm, you know, and ironically, it's probably a lot of spammers also who were hacked in that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, or, or compromised, I should say. Absolutely. So, well, that's what happens when you have a free email service. I mean, heck, I'll admit, yeah. I've, I, I remember, I have a Yahoo account that was from, oh goodness, like 2006, 2005. Right. Yeah. So that one was probably stolen, but luckily that has nothing on it. But yeah, so. Well, know. and hopefully not the same password as other accounts. Oh, no. And oh, as yeah. always, another thing to remember, don't use the same password for different accounts, especially for your email and your, your banking. Make sure those are their own unique passwords. Uh, and change them periodically. I know it's a pain, but change them periodically, just in case. Or if you don't want to do all that, get a password manager and, hey, you know. I um, love using a password manager. There's a lot of good ones out there. I don't. Do you guys have one that's a sponsor or something? Uh, we should. No, 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 no. We recommend. Uh, I, I I think it's like a LastPass or like. I one, like LastPass, or, or, one, one Pass. pass. Yeah. I use Dashlane personally, uh, but they're all good. I mean, it's yeah. Find one, a reputable one, and uh, you know, read some reviews on them and try them out. They all free trials. But password managers will take care of that stuff for you. That way, you can have different crazy gibberish passwords for different websites and they're none of them are the same and you don't have to remember them right absolutely so there you have it and so going from security flaw to security flaw you found one i don't even know how to take this one uh this is uh internet explorer i mean even microsoft themselves have been trying to kill this thing for you know a little while now ever since obviously windows 10 and internet uh edge or uh, ie still uh, <laughs> microsoft edge, edge yeah. microsoft edge there you go and but you have this article here from bleeping computer about internet explorer bug leaks what users type in the url address bar so first of all who's still using internet explorer and second of all <laughs> how how are people still trying to hack internet explorer right um so so what this latest bug is it's it's 
it allows a malicious code that's running on a website to be able to see what you have typed into the address bar. So if you are trying to search for some particular terms by using the address bar, or if you're trying to go to another website from it, then uh, it can see that. And it's a, obviously a privacy issue. You don't want third-party programs to be able to monitor where you're going. That's kind of <laughs> that's kind of the definition of privacy is that you don't want everyone to be able to monitor that without your permission. Right. And so it's a uh, it's an issue with the way that Internet Explorer tries to keep track of the different sides of the website, which one it's going to and which one it's coming from, uh, and and something that needs to be corrected. I mean, it's kind of a scary thing. But you're absolutely right. It's it's you know a lot of people though do use Internet Explorer and do use Edge because those are the things that come with the computer. I mean, it's kind of a joke now because you know it's mostly non-computer people who use the Microsoft browsers, mm -hmm. but most people don't go to the trouble of downloading a different browser when they have a seemingly perfectly good one in front of them. Uh, and as a result, I think that's part of the reason it's targeted so much because the the average user uses Chrome, uh, excuse me, not Chrome, uses, you know, Edge or Internet Explorer. Then if you were a bad guy, obviously that's what you're going to target. Right. And uh, and I know I was kind of being, uh, you know, a little flippant there, but I mean, <laughs> Internet Explorer, uh, I realize that, yes, it's outdated, but at the same time for a lot of computers in, uh, you know, in business settings, in uh, you know, a lot of settings where you can't or management won't upgrade these computers, they're your only option. So, but it, it's, you know, it's kind of like the thing that happened with uh, the NHS earlier this, earlier this year. Even if you find these bugs and even if you publish them like, you know, like a bleeping computer just did for uh, this Internet Explorer bug, like the bugs are known and, they're, and the security flaws are known so that you can ideally you know, update your program, protect yourself from it, blah, blah, blah. But we right. find time and time again that companies just don't want to invest. And, you know, this bug that they just found in Internet Explorer is probably still really exploitable in a lot of business settings. Yep, I, I think you're quite right. Now, whether or not anyone will actually go to the trouble of using it for anything, I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's hard to say, but it's just the idea that, that that can still exist even in a modern browser is kind of scary. Right. So there you have it. And, you know, uh, uh, again, it's probably something that they will look to fix. But at the same time, uh, even, if, even if they did fix it, even if they push out an update tomorrow, uh, millions and millions and millions of computers are still going to be at risk. So how strange that people are still looking for things like that. So, yep. all right. Um, all right. So with that one, uh, now that we have uh, sufficiently scared you and told you that your uh, personal life has been spied upon and stolen, why don't <laughs> we uh, talk a bit about now? All right. Normally we talk about automation and self-driving cars, Tesla, of course, and I think we're going to do it again, but before we get into actual specifics, uh, Mike, if you don't mind, would you mind talking with me about uh, self-driving car legislation? Because a lot of self-driving cars that we talk about, they're developed in private by companies such as Google or Uber or you know these other car, uh, car companies, but the law of the land has these in a gray area. That's so, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's been the, the law for, for self-driving cars has been a little ambiguous and and it's kind of come to the local to the state and sometimes even more local than that to pass laws to allow these things to be tested. And California has a program where where manufacturers can sign up a certain number of cars to be self-driving cars for testing purposes, which is obviously what Google and Tesla and some other companies have done. Uh, and then other states, Nevada comes to mind, and, and even here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, they've done a lot of Uber self-driving testing. And but all of that has to be licensed at a local level, and there's no you know there's no agreement between states to accept that. So unlike your driver's license from you know from Florida, then you can just drive over state lines and it'll still be good. That's right. not the case for self-driving car licenses. And so the federal government is trying to step in a little bit here and try to make a, a more uniformed uh, way to handle this, so that you're not stuck in an awkward position where you live on the state line and the vehicle can't be driven two miles down the road because you're going to cross into someone else's territory. Uh, and that's what, what they're passing here. The, the Senate uh, Commerce Committee has just approved a bill that's going to hopefully move self-driving cars along a little bit and, and make it a little bit easier for self companies working on this to be able to get approval and licensing for it. 
Um, yeah, and, and and so I kind of wanted to get your opinion because you know you can look at the Tesla numbers and you know Tesla numbers they are kind of uh, electric vehicle more than they are self driving, but you know those numbers are one thing. Um, they have a you know a part of this bill is the phase in schedule that I kind of wanted your opinion on, where it says that in the first year. Uh, each manufacturer, so think of your Teslas, think of your Fords, think of your Hondas, they're allowed to put up to 15,000 vehicles, uh, self-driving vehicles on the road uh, in the first year, going up to uh, 80,000 after the third year, and then up, and then, you know, uh, supposedly up to about 100,000, and then all bets are off after about four years. Like, they want to slowly phase them in rather than, mm -hmm. you know, saying, hey, you can sell as many as you want. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think most of those are, are going to, you know, obviously we're going to have a lot of testing phases. Self-driving cars, is it's not an easy thing to do. No. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of variables in that. So it makes sense to to ramp it up slowly. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not necessarily opposed to something like that. I, I, I'm a little concerned with it being so arbitrary, it seems, that, you know, I don't know what makes 15,000 the right number. But, yeah, I... I don't know. Uh, yeah, it, it, it that's probably uh, you know some kind of uh, limit they wanted to probably set it for a couple thousand. Then lobbyists from you know Alphabet and Google <laughs> and they're like, hey, raise that up. But yeah, no, it, it seems like an arbitrary number. But um, you're right. I I think that these are pretty good numbers because you know just like you said, it's not easy and it hasn't really been proven. You know, like it's been proven on normal roads, which is fine. Uh, it's been proven in a couple different driving conditions, which is fine. But you know, take a state like, let's say, New Jersey, which has been under construction since, you know, 1648. And you know, there's a lot of like road signs and there's a lot of uh, non-conventional traffic patterns. Those have to be tested with self-driving cars and other people right. driving around. Them. Well, and the other thing worth noting on this is one of the big parts of this is that it allows them to create exemptions for vehicles without any human controls. Uh, there was consideration to put a requirement in there that it allowed the human driver to take over if necessary, but that in the end didn't end up being put in. I like that. I, in, yeah, I, I'm not sure how you feel about that, but I think if there's going to be ever some kind of fleet, you know, fleet management system where maybe Ford has a fleet of, you know, 10,000 autonomous vehicles operating as kind of, you know, pseudo taxis. You don't want someone hijacking your car because there had to be a steering wheel in it. You know, it, it, if that kind of system is ever going to be in place, you got to take the steering wheel out and, you know, kind of take, that take away the controls. You do. Certainly yeah. at that stage. At the beginning stages in the testing, obviously you need it there. You oh, need sure. the, the – but but I agree with you at that point. Then then you don't want them to be able to take over. Yeah, you're right. And that's something Tesla's talked about doing as well. They have something called the Tesla network that they've kind of teased about here and there Yeah. Uh, where, you know, you buy the car and then while you're sitting at work and the car is just sitting in the parking lot, you can hit a button and tell it to go, you know, join the Tesla network <laughs> and, and drive people around, you know, like Uber or Lyft just with you, no driver in it so your car can be making money for you while you're you know doing whatever else yeah you can tell your car go earn your keep and yeah it can speed off right. and you know because and hey, obviously that's just yeah. uh, uh you know that's not here today they say that the hardware is in the cars and just not the software yet but yeah we shall see yeah and and you know ford has uh, has some talking with uh actually cities because i i, I guess these car manufacturers are kind of seeing the value in being able to sell instead of one car to one person. So yeah, the next big announcement for Tesla is coming out here on the 26th of this month. So on October 26th, Tesla is expected to unveil their electric semi-truck. So we're talking about a full-scale big rig electric car or electric semi-truck uh, from Tesla. And, and we've seen some pictures of it hinted uh, in their announcements, kind of a, a silhouette of the truck. And just this week, some uh, pictures have been caught by uh, people looking carefully at where these t vehicles are test driven and have been leaked uh, of what we think is the actual Tesla semi truck that we'll end up seeing officially on the 26. And this is why I don't believe in aliens. I feel like if <laughs> someone was going to try to keep something secret um, at this point, Aliens would have been clearly photographed with the license number on the back of the spaceship in big letters. I mean, like Elon Musk can't keep his, uh, you know, his his truck secret, and I don't think aliens would do much better. 
But you're right. If you're watching this the video, day and age, when everyone has a phone in their hand, I mean, it has you know, a camera in their hand. Yeah, and and uh, if you're watching the video portion, we actually have the picture up there. It's uh, it's a bit grainy, but I mean, if you look at it, it's a semi truck. It's kind of funny because it's actually being towed by a more <laughs> traditional semi truck, and you can really see the differences between you know what they kind of propose and you know what's currently being used, and it looks about the same, but definitely has that tesla flair to it uh-huh it sure does yeah uh, i i suspect that these are the actual that is the actual uh, uh vehicle that we're going to be seeing and you know the, the the difficult part of part of this of course is the you know size of the battery pack but also how quickly can it get charged because you know trucks aren't going to want to stop for a long time to you know refuel uh, before moving on. So there's some expectation that they're going to be talking about that either as a faster charging method or possibly as a um, battery swap, which mm -hmm. is something Tesla once tried before as a battery swap station. It, I think that would make much more sense in, uh, you know, with semi trucks because with people, um, you know, with, with individuals, I mean, it could be kind of a lot of things, but when you're talking about the efficiencies that you can really put into shipping freight, I mean, you know, just have them set up uh, across state lines, have them set up uh, strategically, kind of like the Tesla charging network, the, the superchargers. Right. Um, right. I think they could do it, you know, and it would be a pretty big boon. And the way that the, the swap station worked before, all the Model S's were developed in such a way that they were compatible with a, a battery swap station. And they built a couple of them. One uh, was open uh, somewhere between Los Angeles and San Francisco, if I remember correctly. Uh, and you had the option at that location to either pay 30 or 40 or 50 bucks to have a battery swapped, which is, you know, a matter of a minute or two, rather than going to the charger, which was free, which then takes, you know, 30 minutes. Right. And th I think part of the problem was that there just wasn't enough interest. Not enough people wanted to pay for it versus just getting a free charge, especially when, you know, what are you going to do? Pay for it to do the battery swap and be done real quick. And then go park the car and use the restroom and buy a coffee. And you know, it's like, well, I might as well just be charging while I'm in there doing that. So I think there wasn't enough demand uh, to to really make it worthwhile for them. But in a semi truck, then that could make a lot more sense. Right, because you know, the average person, how often are you going on, you know, uh, I don't know, six, seven, eight hundred mile trips where a battery swap would kind of make sense, get you back on the road really quickly. Whereas right. with big rigs, let's face it, you know, these people have deadlines and they have to do, you know, 900 miles, you know, whatever the, the, their regulations say they can do, but you know, they're on a tight schedule and those 30 minutes that adds hours, you know, onto their day-to-day -day routine. So I think, and you know, again, in, in a semi, uh, there'd be a lot more interest because again, the truckers probably won't be paying for it. The shipping companies would be, and they'd probably want things faster and more efficient than, you know, yep. cost Well, and tying into our article we were just talking about, about the um, U.S. Senate approving self-driving vehicles, it actually doesn't include vehicles over 10,000 pounds, which would be semi-trucks. Yeah. Uh, so that's something they're going to have to address separately that, they're, you know, I think people are still a little scared about the idea of semi-trucks self-driving down the road. Which is ironic because that's like the first place autonomous driving uh, has been trying to make headway and it's, you know, freight. It's hauling these trucks that have to go long distances and essentially getting the driver out of the driver's seat. Like that's the first place that these companies are trying to innovate in. Yeah. Ironic. And there's a lot of opportunity there because, you know, by and large, most of the time these trucks are moving, it's on the highway. And that's the perfect place to be able to do self-driving vehicles. You don't have as many variables as you do on surface streets. But once you get down to the surface street, I think you're going to you know, need a human at least for a while to pull those big trucks and to back them into the right spot. And I mean, there's a lot of variables that go into those. I watch these guys, you know, move those trucks around some local roads in ways that I can't do with my car. Yeah, no, I've I've seen that too. They uh, a lot of fine, uh, very very fine control. But now th they said that uh, production time probably they're thinking about 2019. So expect these sometime around 2023, and you know they'll probably be on the road because Tesla and their you know kind of ambitious. <laughs> Uh, production well, schedule. and there's been no official dates released yet on it. Again, the the unveiling of this is coming up at the end of this month, so we'll know more next month. Uh, but this is all just you know excitement uh, before the event to to see what will happen. 
for sure. Uh, and I, I mean, uh, Tesla was working, or, or it's uh, it was uh, Tesla was working with another company. Um, I don't know if it says here in the article, but uh, man, what was it? There was uh, some other company that they were teaming up with to kind of bring this to market. So it's not just Tesla doing a Tesla thing. It's Tesla working with, uh, you know, another company to bring this to market, which is definitely encouraging. So, yeah. But like you said, we'll learn more about that in due time. I'll so, be keeping an eye on it. Oh, for sure. And so with that being said, uh, we have time for maybe one or two more stories. Why don't we go on over to... Uh, yeah, why don't we do this one? So the transatlantic, the transatlantic internet cable that you have here, uh, we talked a bit about it. I love talking about it again because um, why don't you describe kind of why these ocean cables are so important? Because I think a lot of people, they don't think about how data gets from one continent to another. They, I think maybe they think that satellites do it. You know, you beam it up to a satellite, you know, bring it back down from a satellite. But, you know... Am I right in thinking that these cables are what connect, you know, like the severing of cables such as these is the reason that the entire continent of Africa can lose internet, you know, when someone puts an anchor in the wrong place. Right. Yeah, no, that that's true. That that can be a problem. And so this is, you're right, this is a backbone of communication between different continents. I mean, having underground cables is huge and is still the primary way we're communicating over there. Uh, satellites are great, and they certainly have their, their benefits. For example, you know, if you're somewhere inland, not near where the cable's crossing the ocean, or somewhere in the middle of nowhere, you know, you, as long as you have an open sky or you know, open view into the sky, you can hit a satellite. Uh, the problem with satellites is that they're there's two things with with speeds as far as communications go. You know, when you're talking about your internet connection, you have your your bandwidth, how much data you can move, and we always talk about megabits. You know, that my internet is 50 megabits or what have you. But also latency, and that becomes more important when you're talking about you know video communication or vo voice over IP or even gaming. That you know, not only how much information you can move, but how long it takes to get there. Right. So so, and that's the issue with satellites is that you have a latency that's sometimes 10 times or sometimes sometimes 20 times more than what you would have if you go through a cable. Even if it's a, a, a cable that's you know, 4,000 miles long, like the one we're discussing here that they're putting in between Virginia Beach and, uh, and Spain, uh, it can actually communicate through there faster than, than through a satellite. And, and that's why these things are important, because we're relying more and more on voice over IP and video conferencing and even loading websites. You know, people want them instant. You don't want to have that delay before information starts to move. Yeah, and the one I, the the one thing I like about this one is that uh, if you look at a chart and you know you can find it all over the internet where you can see where all of these uh, cables are laying along the sea floor, and you know they publish them so that boats don't actually again you know kind of cut them with their anchors. They do it so that you know just people know to stay clear of them. Uh, this one actually takes a different route into Europe because you know there's a lot of cables going from North America to Europe, but this mm -hmm. one actually takes a much different route. So they're kind of saying that if, you know, uh, it, a natural disaster were to hit and it cut all those other cables for some miraculous reason, this one wouldn't be affected. Yeah, and for redundancy, it just makes sense. I mean, you, you don't want all of your eggs in one basket. You don't want all of your wires running along the same path because it's just asking for trouble. Eventually, one day, something will happen, and, and you want to have a backup. So that's that's the biggest part of this. And and this is a big cable. I mean, it's, it's uh, being backed by Microsoft and Facebook and is capable of 160 terabits per second. You know, we were lot. talking about megabits or gigabits. This is 160 terabits per second. That's a fast cable. It's it that will certainly drain your monthly allotment of data that you're allowed to use. Uh, it's in, in about it's a tenth a of a second. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and but it's uh and, and the article makes a great point here. Uh, you know, at the very end it says, uh, you know how they're talking about business where it says, quote, most of the global financial or I'm sorry, most of the global infrastructure was designed for voice traffic because when you think about these cables, uh, you know, I'm sure it started with things like, uh, oh my God, the the things that do the beeps, uh, telegraphs. Uh, code? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, telegraphs, I'm sure, were like the sure. first things. Uh, and then, of course, phones and phone cables and phone lines. I mean, let's face it. Now we do. Now we demand uh, 4K and Netflix um, and <laughs> HDR streamed to our TVs. 
that's going to need something more robust than what was originally designed for, you know, phone conversations. So this is right. something designed for, you know, something more robust than just, you know, talking. Yep, you're absolutely right. And and to a larger scale, too, because you don't have just the elite using this technology now. You have everybody able to use this technology. And so you need the backbone to be able to handle that. Right. So there you have it. I mean, it's uh, certainly definitely good. And I'm happy Microsoft did it. Uh, I I don't know how I feel the fact that, you know, private industry has to be the one to, you know, kind of put up our infrastructure for us. But, hey, capitalism, that is what it is. Um, and, hey, you know, maybe this may lead to, uh, I don't know, cheaper data rates, uh, you know, for the end user or something <laughs> like that. I don't know for the end user what this is really going to mean. But for large uh, organizations, it just means quicker data, which is good, I guess. Yeah, that's right. And even for the end user, especially overseas, or whether you're trying to connect to someplace overseas where they're trying to connect with us, uh, it, it'll be a good thing. Right, right, right. So there you have it. And I think with that, uh, Mike, we did pretty good in getting to all of our topics. Uh, folks out there, Oof, if you... I'm exhausted. I know. If, uh, if you want to check on any stories, check our sources, see if we were just pulling it out of uh i'm not gonna say where but you know just uh hey head on over to computer america and we have all of the articles that we talked about today listed right there for you and before we say goodbye mike uh what's going on at uh, techguy.org because uh you know whenever people kind of contact us and ask uh if we could help them out if we can't help them out we usually send them over to your forum and uh yeah how are things going with techguy.org Oh, going great. Yeah, if you have any kind of computer problems, whether you're having issues with, you know, viruses or installing a program or a printer or a scanner or whatever you have, we have someone over there that can help. And it's all for free. It's a community of people who are trying to help one another with computer problems. You go there, sign up for free, post your question, and a volunteer will try and point you in the right direction. Uh, it's paid for by advertisers and sponsors and donations, uh, but none of that is required. It's it's just people trying to help one another. So, And while you're there, you'll probably find a question you can help someone with. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, it, it's uh, kind of funny because, you know, you mentioned that you, you were having some connectivity issues. I mean, that is one that I've actually looked, you know, looked at techguy.org. And uh, our service provider, not going to name names, but they are a pretty – reliable um uh, i, I want to say crook criminal that implies some, something illegal just <laughs> they they they, uh, they have poor connectivity uh when it comes to uploading and you know it's uh it, it's just nice to be able to go to techguy.org and see that i'm not the only one having the problem and see other solutions that people have offered and try those out so it's a great resource everyone we, we highly recommend it and mike music means that we are just about done i want to say thank you so much my pleasure thanks for having me have a great day all right you too you too so everyone else out there thank you for joining us here on computer Mir uh, wow computer america tune in tomorrow as we let's see let's see let's see as we have on with us the john petty research that's right, and we're going and we're going to be talking about different GPUs, different systems, 4K, VR, uh, gaming, CAD, uh, alter, uh, wow, uh, augmented reality, things like that. It's going to be a lot of fun, and we're going to be talking about it uh, by the numbers. So tune in tomorrow, Computer America, same time, same place. And until then, everyone, have a great day. Catch you tomorrow, and uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Bye bye, everyone.